everybody and welcome back to the identity and mental health gaming series panel series um this one is going to be as you may notice a little different than the rest of our series um because this is a gender panel specifically transgender panel um and so today things are a little bit different but before we get to the things that are different let's talk about the things that are the same um so as always, um, trans identity is not a monolith. And while we have a variety of um, different lived experiences and views here today, uh, we by no means are talking for or even trying to cover all that is trans identity in the world because we simply cannot do that. We are not a monolith. We are as all groups are hetero, uh, heterogeneous, uh, yeah, Gen mm, words. It's We're one dead. of those days, fam. All mm. right, so uh, this panel, we do want to thank uh, Riot Games for sponsoring uh, this whole series, and this panel is no different. Uh, so shout out to them. We are, in fact, talking predominantly from a um, United States uh, context when we are talking about things we may be talking about different cultures and things but uh we are residing in the u.s and so please note that that is where we're going to speak to nothing said here is meant to be medical or mental health um advice or treatment while you may find this therapeutic um, and you may find the information helpful. We may talk about some resources. Please note that we are not your therapist. We are not your doctor. We are not actually even part of your support system. So please check in with your own um, community and support and care team to figure out what works for you. Um, that being said, and with this panel also as noted, not being centered around a racial or ethnic group um we won't have a conversation about you know our culture or identities individual experiences with the land and so i do also want to put forth a land acknowledgement here um all of us on north america are sitting standing laying uh, existing on what is stolen uh, and otherwise ill-gotten land uh, that has not been properly cared for. And so I want to encourage everyone watching this live or in the VOD to support any and all land back efforts and decolonial efforts because it's the right thing to do regardless of what identities you hold. Um, that said, I am coming to you from um, Peoria and Kickapoo lands, and uh, I'm Cassie, and my pronouns are they, them, and I'm going to let the uh, panelists do a short introduction, both of themselves and their pronouns and what lands they are coming to you from. Let's go in the order of thing, Ace. Oh, wow. Um, hi, <laughs> my name is Ace. I'm coming from you uh, from Muncie Lenape. I apologize if I didn't say that correctly. I am trying my best. My, I think I said my pronouns are they, them. I am a black queer immigrant born and raised in Jamaica. I'm an activist, I'm a content creator and full time policy analyst. Next up is Sahar. Oh, it's me. Okay. Um... Hey, I'm Sahara. I'm, my pronouns are they, them. I'm a non-binary two-spirit of the Muscogee Nation. Um, I'm a writer, a social media manager for StackUp, and a gay gaming pros honoree. Um, I write pretty much anything I can try, and I'm currently living on uh, Kiowa, Osage, uh, Wichita, Comanche, and uh, Kickapoo lands. And Rue? I'm Rue. My pronouns are they and he. Uh, and I am a uh, game designer, a sensitivity consultant and sensitivity reader, uh, and a community organizer. I do charity fundraising organization 
Um, and I am coming to you live from Mary's River or Empinafu Band of Kalapuya Nation. And Gnome. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Gnome, uh, pronouns he, him. I am a trans man, a Jewish as well. And I am the community manager for Jackbox Games, as well as a podcast producer in TTRPG everything. Um, and I'm coming to you from uh, the lands of Peoria as, as well. Yep. And so, um... As noted, I'm Cassie. I am the um, resident mental health clinician on today's panel as well. Again, a therapist, not your therapist. Um, and so as we um, get into it today, let me make sure I haven't forgotten any of my handy dandy reminders. Oh, yes. Please note that as with these other, um, as with all of these panels, we are not going to be shying away from hard conversations. Um, I am in constant contact with the panelists as, as well as our production team. If at any point, any of the conversation gets a bit much for you, please make sure that you are taking care of yourselves. Um, if you'd like to ask questions or have comments in chat, that is what chat is for. Um, I can see the chat and um, may, you know, uh, pull out some questions and include them as part of today's discussion. So with that said, um, let's go ahead and get into it. And let's just go ahead and start with a, you know, easy, broad little question of how has games factored into your mental health journey? Uh, I guess I'll I'll speak up. Uh, for me, uh, games kind of like I I'll just throw in an example. Uh, when I was in the military, there was like a period where they uh, were having us stand these twelve-hour watches and in stairwells. Um, and <laughs> I remember after one day where I stood all these watches back to back, I was like. Ah, I'm so tired of all of this. I was like so angry and then I was just like, you know what? I need to get a console and I need to play some games and I will feel so much better. And I played Fallout and it was just like instantly like relief. You know, it felt amazing. Um, for me, it's about escapism. Um, playing video games allows me to to be distracted from what's going on in the real world. Um, as an activist, it's very easy to burn out and get stressed. Um, so to be honest with you, I'm like a little 12-year-old boy. I play Fortnite all the damn time. That's where most of my paycheck goes to. Um, so <laughs> Fortnite allows me to get my anger out in ways that are healthy. Let's just say that. Uh I play more tabletop games than I play video games. Uh, in the video game sphere though, I'm a big fan of horror games. And I think part of it for me in horror games is like, um, I can control the things that scare me in a horror game in a way that I can't control the things that scare me in real life. Uh, so it's kind of like empowering to be able to like get one over on the things that happen in horror games that I might not necessarily have that power to do in real life. Um, but from a tabletop standpoint, um, like tabletop games have seriously improved my like ability to socialize because I have a uh, generalized anxiety disorder and a social anxiety disorder. And so like playing tabletop games has made it a lot easier for me to interact with people, not only in the gaming space, but also outside because uh, getting more experience talking to people and like getting into character and working collaboratively with others at a table has really improved essentially all socializing that I do as a person. Yeah, uh, just to branch on that, I think socialization was kind of a big one for me, um, especially really, really young. Um, I kind of always been playing, I think I got my first, my first like council was uh, um, some like, uh, Disney uh, or like Mickey Mouse uh, council of, of, of like a Frogger version of Mickey Mouse. And, and it was great. And I, like, I love that stuff. Um, but then everything started getting connected online and it became a way to connect with others, other people who made me feel 
safe, people who made me feel smart, people who made me just feel welcomed and accepted. Yeah. So we've had a couple mentions of games and genres of games and everything. Are there are there specific games that are your like go to, whether that's you know, tabletop, LARP, video games, hybrid games, card games. Like, I know, I know I'm on the horror side and like Dead by Daylight is one of my, is one of my go-tos, both for the like getting things out and the socializing and, and just the general enjoyment of horror. So does anyone else have those like go-to mental health like games? Damn, yeah, DVD is really good. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, please go ahead. <laughs> DVD is really good. Like I hang out with my best friends, the three best friends that I have every Tuesday night. Um, and we play DVD. We play Fortnite. Um, sometimes we'll play like other games. They play Apex. I don't really care for Apex. I'll listen to them get angry and shoot things. But like again, like going back to the whole socialization, like COVID has been freaking hard for me. Um, I've I've lived alone for a majority of COVID, so. Having Twitch, having Twitter, having games, and having friends on Discord and things like that has really saved my mental health, if I'm being honest with you, without getting into detail. Gaming has saved me and has attributed to a better mental health. But yeah, I love video games. I wish I could do board games, um, but like I get really overwhelmed and I have a brain injury. So I'm just like, you're talking too much and I'm over it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, I, like, I, I actually am kind of the opposite. I will not play horror games because I've experienced and seen enough horror as a medic. So, like, to me, that's not an escapism. I don't want to go and play gory games. I very much like games. Um, I love tedious games. I love games where I have to organize things and track my inventory. Um, I've played Minecraft for a year. I was in, like, the Minecraft alpha. Um, and I've been playing Minecraft for years. I'm not good at it, despite the time, but like, that's just the one game that I can continuously go back to because it's so open world. You can do literally anything in this game, and it's also a great way to socialize and connect with others. I'm not good at video games, like as a person, <laughs> I'm just not good at them. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I have a lot of fun playing them, but I will never call myself like good at any video game. Um, and so like my go-to like socialization game uh, is Phasmophobia. Um, but I'm really bad at Phasmophobia because I talk a lot and the game <laughs> pays attention to you if you make noise. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. So, <laughs> so my friends will play with me and they'll be like, hey, why don't you go stand in that room where the ghost is and just keep talking? And then we'll do the actual <laughs> investigating. Um, but yeah, it's kind of like uh, what, what uh, y'all were saying. Like, it's a good way to get to spend time with my friends, especially like friends who don't live near me or during COVID who I couldn't see otherwise, like getting to just hang out and chill in a Discord call while we play a game is really nice. Uh, for me, it's uh, it's actually The Sims. Um, I could, like anytime I'm just feeling like I need something to soothe me, it's The Sims. Uh, it, it helps me sleep for one, for two, it's like very, uh, it's just, it's nice to get to like take this sim and like all these different families I have and like sit down and um you know get kind of control their lives but not to a point where like you know I'm god but enough to where I'm like <laughs> nudging them in the right direction you know like hey you know go do these things and have you know take care of yourself um but if they die they die <laughs> <laughs> um you know yeah, and I get to design these beautiful houses too. So like I enjoy doing that. And uh, you know, so that's that's been my go-to game. I probably have a couple thousand hours in the Sims. <laughs> yeah, so that's my game. Any of those games where you get to like own a house and customize it, I'm like, this is escapism for me because I'm never gonna own a house in real life. <laughs> but I can build whatever house I want <laughs> in Animal Crossing. <laughs> And so yeah, my sons are millionaires. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I think I think we've come across some common themes, even if we engage them in different ways, right? Of escapism, finding 
aspects of things that we maybe can't have or don't have at, at, at this period of time. And so knowing that, right, and being on, on this theme, I, I, am, I then am kind of wondering about how, how games have factored in, if at all, when it comes to also your gender journey. I got lucky. <laughs> I got lucky <laughs> being born AFAB, and the majority of video games are male oriented, right? So, like, I just had all of this masculine content thrown at me, and it was like, oh, cool, I, I get to be a boy in all of these things. And I, I loved it. I got lucky. That, yeah. <laughs> I think that's a really good way to look at it. I feel like, I don't know, like, for me growing up, um being Jamaican and like dealing with all that homophobia and stuff like that like games like Last of Us like seeing queer people in games was like something I never thought was gonna happen it was always a dream um especially when they're like doing regular things that we do like smoking weed like you know like little things that's just like the details in life that you never think are gonna be portrayed and you feel visible so and I played Sims a couple of times and like being able to create the life that I know that I deserve and I should have had um has been really amazing as well so like finding my non-binary my trans journey through video games has been very eye-opening and i never thought that video games would be more than just like a way to have fun for me but like a way to discover who i truly am um kind of uh in a similar boat to gnome um i'm a non-binary trans man but i also had the uh benefit of being an afab person where video games kind of default you into the male or masculine slot um and like uh should have known a lot earlier when every time i got a game i was like hmm i could be the like hyper feminine character or the like mediumly mask character and I always picked the masculine option because especially in kids games like th like the feminine options tend to be very like high femme and then the mask options are like just a dude who lives in your basement um <laughs> or Link from Legend of Zelda exactly <laughs> um and so like getting to like see things through that lens and like get gendered correctly on my like little DS when no one in real life would gender me correctly was just kind of this very nice like uh like escape in a way of like in this world in the video game everyone calls me by pronouns that I want to be called by so I don't have to sit around in real life and get misgendered all the time um and then uh from a tabletop perspective like I think I would not have like explored my gender at all if it wasn't for tabletop um, because I've, like, even before I knew I was trans, I played characters of genders that were different from, like, my assigned gender at birth, and sort of getting to, like, slip into that character and, like, experience life through that lens and get gendered that way as my characters really, like, opened my eyes to being like, oh, like, if people can respect that my character's pronouns are they, them, they can respect that my human pronouns are also they, them, and they can change that in real life too. And I think that was kind of like eye-opening and very gender euphoric for me as well. Tabletop was the first place I started um, experimenting with uh, my pronouns and gender and things and to have my game group, like be able to do it and everything was what like allowed me to be like, oh, okay, hold on here. <laughs> Yeah, um, I think for me, like, uh, well, we'll go back to Link. Like, I, I was, you know, when I was a kid and I was playing The Legend of Zelda, I remember just, like, I love that character. And I, I remember I even, like, used to, like, I made my own Link costume, um, you know, and I used to dress up as Link and run around, you know, and kids back then even noticed that I wasn't quite uh, what the binary was supposed to be so they're all you know they were all pointing it out and as i got you know older and older older more of these games came out where you could choose your gender you know i would play as like uh, a a guy and i would play as a girl and i love both sides of it you know and uh like i would i would just have so much fun mass effect 
that was a big one for me. Um, getting to play Shepard as both male and female was a blast. Um, and then, you know, when the Sims, like Sims 4 started to do the whole, you can uh, um, have trans and non-binary characters. And like, they made the clothing all gender neutral for the most part. I was just like, I'm going to have a ball. Like, I'm going to go all out. I'm going to play with these characters and, you know, get to um, play around with all the aspects of gender. Because I, for me personally, gender-wise, I'm I'm very uh, fluid. I, I like to go all over the place with it. I love all of it, masculine, feminine. So, you know, getting to do that in video games, you know. Um, because, you know, buying that much clothing, <laughs> that's expensive, you know, so. <laughs> Plus, it takes forever to grow my hair out, so. <laughs> I, I I think one thing I'm struck by in this conversation, right, and in conversations I have like this are the ways that we are talking about both the definitive problems of the industry <laughs> and, but how we are working around them or how we are making them work or have made them work for us despite the shortcomings right because the other question we can ask right is like okay so what are the problems with with representation with trans representation in games and that could be an entire semester long course on its own right um but <clears throat> at the same time we're talking about how games has really also helped us and so i also kind of want to go ahead and just throw throw that idea into the pot and and have a chat there too of like the way in which that perhaps like games could be helpful but also like y'all for real not <laughs> not all in androgynous means masculine oh yeah oh yeah like, um, I think games, like games that are trying to be better about non-binary representation are falling into that same, like, scope that sort of the internet falls into with non-binary representation, where non-binary folks have to be skinny, white, vaguely androgynous mask folks. And if you don't fit into any of those categories, if you're a fat person, if you're not white if you're a non-binary femme person like you don't see yourself in media in the same way that those like 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 that sort of stereotype of non-binary identity is and so like it can be a little frustrating to be like oh this character has a non bi like this game has a non-binary character and it just looks like a like if you asked the internet of cis people to tell you what a non-binary person looks like, they would summon this image to mind every time. Yep. I know I, think, I had uh, issues okay. when, um, like one really negative thing about just gaming in general and, and trying to have that social element is that we could talk to each other. And before I knew I was trans, before I came out as trans, when I would play a game and present it as femme, because that's, you know, as a fab, um, people treated me differently. They, they would treat it, they, uh, you would be sexualized, you'd be harassed, you would be all these other things, have horrible threats made to you, have nasty images sent in your way, um, terrible things being said. And like, this is something that femme presenting and, and women experience any time that they play a video game or game in general. And as soon as like I started taking testosterone and I identified as a man, my voice dropped a little bit. You know, if I want to play video games, I'll drop my voice just a little lower so that I don't get that harassment. Um, and it, 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 it disappeared. As soon mm. as I identified as a man, that all disappeared. I've had such enjoyable, like, the privilege to enjoy just playing video games without the cruelty, the harassment, aside from like, yeah, I'm going to bone your mom, dude, you know, like stuff like that. But like, there's some nasty people that play video games and think that it's okay to treat people differently because of the gender that they are. 
I think for me, I, I have a hard time with like supporting games that like will openly say that they don't represent us and they kind of like just move forward. And those be the same games that I want to play, like Phasmo, right? Like they don't care about sexual assault and things like that without getting into detail. And like we've seen this with other games, Overwatch, like all these games that people want to play so that they can have fun. Apex even where people are constantly getting harassed. I know so many black women, black femme women that get harassed in Apex and they're really good at it. Um, so for me, it's like always an internal struggle because I get nervous enjoying a game because I'm like, how long is this going to last until I find out something that's going to make me not enjoy this game or I'm going to have to play it in secret. Um, and I hate that. So just like representation isn't there, but also like people don't apologize and take accountability. And that also hurts. Um, I think I think a thing for me that I've uh, been kind of noticing, like there's this trend where they'll make a non-binary character, something like a robot or like a, some kind of odd yeah. creature thing. And I'm just like, you know, uh, I, I, it's cool. I like the design, but I'm, I'm not a robot, you know, <laughs> like I'm a, I'm a, I'm a person, you know, so I feel like that's a little bit dehumanizing sometimes. So, and I feel like that doesn't actually help us with our representation because, you know, uh, being able to be seen as people um, is really what, uh, that's the thing you know that's that's what we need we need to be seen as normal people who look like every day you know like I look like this you know um <laughs> you know I don't I don't look like I don't look like a robot I don't <laughs> you know I have expressions too so <laughs> um as like as someone who isn't trans femme, I can't speak to the same level as a trans femme person would, and I'm not going to try to. Um, but I think another problem with video games is like when they think they're doing representation, but they're also actually doing like a fetishization, especially of trans femme bodies, but of trans mask bodies too. Um, like when a game is like, look, you can give your character whatever genitalia you want. And we've made a slider to make it bigger or smaller. This is trans representation. And I'm like, no, this is fetishization of trans people. And you need to, you know, analyze that cyberpunk 2077. Um, <laughs> and just, you know, think about like, and so, like, it's it, it's upsetting to me as someone who, like, doesn't experience that same kind of, uh, like, oh. fetishization, but in the same reign, it's like, so you don't really care about trans people, you care about what cis people think of us and how cis people like to fetishize us. Yeah, let's, okay, okay, real talk <laughs> for a moment. Um, stop thinking about what's in people's pants unless they <laughs> ask you to. <laughs> Like, at what point are we going to get away from this biological deterministic nonsense? Like, I don't care if you have a penis or a vulva or both or nothing. Like, gender is beyond what is in your pants. And it's just wild to me that in... <laughs> in the the eurocentric like white colonialist gaze like gender is a bit of flesh that like where does your flesh dangle right yeah. like the fact the fact that i that like people get my pronouns wrong because i have tits is wild it's wild to me it's like i'm i know they're glorious it doesn't make them female like they are attached to a non-binary person <laughs> And, and that aspect, I think, can, can kind of also segue because we are talking about um, a lot of games that are, it, like, the mainstream games that we've been talking about are games that are made predominantly, overwhelmingly from a white Euro-American stance. And we have a lot of different folks on this panel and that also means gender as a binary did not always exist always exist throughout the world that happened through colonialism and imperialistic policy and so 
I'm wondering if folks want to go ahead and start getting into the fact that like this is not new pre-colonialism the variety of conceptualization around gender sex family roles like societal roles was wide and broad across a vast variety of cultures yeah so you know as a two-spirit um uh uh, a lot of my tribes had other names for um, different expressions of gender and like uh, having those been lost to time because of uh, you know things like being sent to boarding schools um, you know uh, having to suppress a lot of all these uh, different gender expressions in order to be able to interact with colonial society um, and then just just so much like kind of just taken away from us um, because there was there was like these spectrum of uh, gender just going on over here for different tribes. Not all of them had it, but uh, plenty of them did. You know, um, I know for a fact uh, quite a few of mine did. And then even with roles, um, most of my tribes are um, uh, matrilineal and matriarchal um they were all uh their whole societies were run by women and so then you know like the major decisions were made by women um even war um while men would fight you know a lot of times it was the women that decided this is this is what's going to happen you know and growing up with that too growing up knowing that women uh were running things and kind of still are <laughs> uh, among my family, you know, <laughs> like uh, a lot of, I grew up around just, you know, women running things and strong, strong female figures, just like um, being kind of the, the lead of the family and, you know, like growing up in with that and then having to deal with uh, going to school in this society. And it's like, uh, it's it's a contrast. It's a major contrast, you know, um, and and that's that's important to me to like highlight because um, you know being a, a two spirit, my you know my expression is not like like I'm uh, society wants it to be, you know. Um, I think. First, I want to say, like, it, I think it's very funny how it's always cis people that are calling trans people groomers and shit, but they're the ones that care about what's going on in people's pants, and we could give a fuck less, but we'll keep that where it is. Um, but, like, being born and raised in one of the most homophobic countries in the world, I have seen a lot of bullshit. Like, people care a lot about the Bible. People care a lot about these structures like the men are supposed to do this the women are supposed to do this but like then caribbean men ain't shit and then the women are single and they're the breadwinners they're the ones building families and it's just like yo we can undo this because we don't need the trauma for us to realize that these gender roles don't need to exist um and coming to america seeing that perpetuated in schools being seeing that perpetuated in games it's disgusting so to be honest with you, I'm gonna keep it short on this question and just say I implore people to unlearn the things that we that were engraved in us from birth or in books, um, whether it's the Bible, whether it's a book you had in social studies, unlearn that shit because there's so much more potential that we have in ho however we identify um, that is so much beyond like what the fuck the book says. Um, something that like like when we're talking about colonialism like I think missionary colonialism is something that we like don't talk about as much and the fact that like Catholicism and Christianity is so rooted in colonialism and like it's a like central factor of those religions to be missionary and to be colonialist and to subject different indigenous peoples and cultures to their patriarchal very male-run structure um and like uh like a lot of other like religious backgrounds, whether it be indigenous spirituality from whatever nation you're from or um, no mentioned, and I'm also Jewish, uh, Judaism recognizes eight genders, um, but the like 
Western lens that people have taken um, to be called something like Judeo-Christian whenever they're talking about like the things that the right wing, uh, like crypt Christo fascists are doing. Um, it always kind of like silences Jewish non-binary folks and Jewish trans folks whose gender identities are respected and supported by the Talmud and by like the culture that we're entrenched in. Um, and so like being Jewish and having that connection has been a huge part of my like trans journey and trans identity because it's so much more supportive. But then explaining that to people who were raised Christian or people who were only raised in the like Christian based society that we live in, like, no, I didn't have to like come out to people at synagogue because I was already an androgynous person in that space. Um, and like how that can be simultaneously very uplifting um, when I'm in that space, but very othering when I'm everywhere else and everyone who was raised in that Christ, like Christian world set is like, no, no, there's only ever been two genders. All these other ones are new. Um, and how that's also, um, like Sahara was saying, very silencing for indigenous folks who non-binary genders are a part of our culture as well. Um, and like how it's very silencing that specifically Christian colonialism has destroyed all of those other genders, or at least tried to on a surface level and silence the expression of other genders. I like that you, uh, I mean, just to kind of like, uh, um, I, I like that you brought up Judaism a little bit here because we, we have the privilege of being associated as being white. We're white enough until we're not, right? And to, to kind of tie it in, back into video games, um, I think there's a lot of liberation and a lot of storytelling that can be done um, through the power of video games, which empower people of marginalized identities. Um, for me in particular, remember, I, I don't necessarily like uh, gory video games, but uh, I played a lot of Wolfenstein, which is as gory as gory can be. Um, but he, the, the great thing about Wolfenstein, which unfortunately is uh, co-opted by a lot of like right-wing people, by a lot of conservative folks, um, uh, it, it, they're missing the whole point, is you have this protagonist who is Jewish. He is the ideal Captain America. And he's Jewish and he's able to get into all of these Nazi things and tear them apart, literally tear them apart. Um, but when it comes to gender, you, you have this, you know, that ideal man, that alpha male, right? Is strong, cut jaw, you know, short hair, blonde, blue eyes, white skin. And that's everything that the protagonist from Wolfenstein is, except he's Jewish. And he takes that and is this gentle, truly a gentle being. He falls in love. He assists others who need help. He works with the disabled, the disenfranchised, all of these other groups that, that have been discarded by white supremacy. And to, to see that in a video game inherently to me, it offers empowerment. And it's really cool to see. And I think we're starting to see more games kind of evolve that way and to tell those type of stories. And, and again, I, I think it's just a, a level of empowerment that we didn't see 10, 15, 20 years ago in games. Yeah. And I do think it's also so like from, from a Black African diasporic angle too, right? Like, I have a, I, I have it for a different panel that I'm on, but like this book, it's called The Invention of Women Making African Sense of Western Gender Discourses. And it talks about how like in, in many places, pre-colonization in Africa, specifically, this is looking at a Western African, largely Nigerian context, like the idea of woman did not exist like in in the way as conceptualized by the white colonizers 
and this idea of there are entire languages it both Africa, Asia, in multiple places, North American indigenous languages where like the gendering of everything just doesn't exist. There were there there aren't even genderings of, you know, people let like let alone uh objects. Um and and so the way the way that that then comes into like game design and like you can tell when games are made by queer folk by trans folks right like if anyone has played uh any of validate any of mon any of the monster prom series any of of these games that are just very queer queerly clear um <laughs> <laughs> it's it's very obvious when representation is being done right because it just feels effortless. It's not a big "here's our non-binary character, welcome." It's it's just like nah, this this person uses these pronouns and like these experience and like this is the experience that you play through, and it's beautiful. So I know we are getting close to break, but before we go to break i do want to go ahead and give the moment for you all if you have anything else to say about like when we're when we're just talking about trans gaming mental health and what comes up for you in those intersections in particular because i know also sometimes when we see trans characters um it is in a very uh damaging stereotypical um light um i'm actually i i'm still thinking <laughs> <laughs> no worries. um i think this happens in um, all of my identities of being black like i'm tired of seeing games that like that do portray us in that way. Like we don't need to to bond over our trauma. We don't need a trauma bond in order to feel like visible in video games. Um, it should be effortless, like validate. I loved that game. That was amazing. And it was like you said, it wasn't like they put up a poster like, oh, these are the things that we're gonna hit. No, you just did that shit. And it was received well because you just did that shit. Um, and yeah, I just want because I remember there was this game for like the black community it was supposed to be for the black community and it was like a son and a dad driving down and like they were getting pulled over by the cops and shit and i'm like but what's good with the trauma porn like it's not that serious we could talk about something else that makes black people feel um represented like miles morales is pretty cool i know that for like the latin uh the black latinx um people but yeah we don't have to do trauma y'all we're way more than trauma and a lot of trans people don't even have trauma like in the ways that you think we do Yeah, I will say, like, as uh, someone, like, when I came out on a lot of stuff with my family, like, I actually was pretty quickly accepted by most of my family. Um, I have some family members who didn't, and they're Christians, so, <laughs> um, you know, uh, but, like, I haven't, I haven't exactly experienced the level of, of trauma that they display on some of these characters and sometimes I just want to see happy happy trans characters you know um, happy non-binary characters you know they're just going about in, in a game um, having a good time and having um, or even just going on an adventure you know it's um, I mean video games are often in an escape you know I don't need to not all of us want to see this kind of um, pain all the time sometimes you mm. just want to play the game and just play this character be successful and like and, and be happy you know um more of that i can't play the last of us uh because it features something that i am viscerally afraid of uh mushrooms <laughs> but um when the last of us 2 came out uh one of my friends was like oh like 
you should watch all the cutscenes. There's a trans character in the new Last of Us game. It's really cool. There's a trans character. And I was like, okay, uh, I'll watch a cutscene compilation that doesn't involve any mushrooms. Um, <laughs> and I go to watch it, and the cutscenes are all the character getting dead named and misgendered, and people talking about how like he was cast out of his community for being trans. And it was just this like trauma porn scenario for trans people. And I was like, this isn't representation though. This is meant to make cis people feel good for the bare minimum of not being mean to this trans person. Um, and like, that's not what I want when I see a trans narrative in a triple A studio game. I wanna see a trans person getting to live their life. Like you have the money to make trans people in your games and just let them be themselves. Why does it have to be about trauma all the time? Say that shit. Well, again, for the folks in the back. So <laughs> I, I think that's so like, I don't know how, I don't know how many times we have to say it, but that is so like, that is so often the fact, right? Like we'll, we'll get the story of the dead black trans woman, but we won't get the story of the life and the people positively impacted. And it's so exhausting. It is so heartbreaking, right? Because it's always the accessory, right? It's always the fridge. It's always the death. It's always the trauma. And that's not like, just because many of us have been through traumas doesn't mean that that's the only thing about us. Exactly. Yeah. Um, it, it's kind of weird too, because it kind of puts like a, um, a value on our pain, which feels weird, you know, like, eh, I'm worth more than, than the pain, you know. Yeah, and then for like, because there are some cis people that generally don't know, and then they're taking in that content, and then they meet a trans person IRL, they're like, oh my god, they've been through all this stuff, how do I not do XYZ? Like, when you put us in that light, that's all the, the nicest people see, and now they're dickheads because they don't know anything else about us. They don't know that we're just normal people. They don't know that in order to be trans, you don't have to go through a 12-step process of trauma. Yeah. <laughs> there is no trans gauntlet, or at least there shouldn't be, <laughs> right? Like, I am, okay. So before we go to break, um, I hate WPATH. Um, for those of you who don't know what that is, WPATH is the um, world organization that, uh, ha that, that settled the um, guidelines for what trans folks need in order to get care and what the like baseline of care is. And so like the, the standards and the, the letters and all of that kind of thing, while those are slowly but surely being removed, that came from WPATH. And that is a gauntlet that does not need to exist and is gross. And I like, I don't wanna see that in games. I don't want to play a video game where I have to go to two different medical, two different therapists and have meetings with them in order to sign off on the fact that I am who I say I am and should be allowed to get the medical treatment needed uh, to uh, live, live that life that's being denied to me. That is messed up. So I don't know about y'all, but I'm tired. It's yeah. What it's what tired. happened to escapism? Yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> just throws that away. And so, um, tomorrow we're gonna go on break, but tomorrow, uh, November twentieth, is Trans Day of Remembrance. This is we are doing. We are filming this on uh, at the tail end of uh, Trans Awareness Week. And Trans Day of Remembrance is a day in which we remember all of the trans people who have died, been murdered, refused care, uh, died by suicide, etc. And so during the break, I'd like everybody watching to, yes, take care of yourself, but 
I would like you to go look up what trans day of remembrance events, mutual aid funds, etc., are going on in your area and see if there's something that you can do to support trans folks in real time, because while we don't want to see it as the only way we see ourselves in games, there is unfortunately a lot of trauma that our communities go through. And so um, we're going to go on a 10 minute break, take some of that time to find some trans day of remembrance um, materials, events, etc. near you. And we'll come back in about 10 minutes and continue this conversation and talk, dive a little bit more into uh, the mental health uh, side and resources and differences of identity. So we'll see y'all in 10.
Welcome back, everybody. I hope that you had a refreshing break, got your water, got your food, got everything you need, uh, because we are jumping right back in uh, to this panel and uh, kind of from where we left off, we are going to be uh, moving more into some direct mental health discussion. Uh, so as we were saying before break, our trauma is not all we want to see in games. And I think we have pretty well covered some of the, the issues as well as our desires for games. And I'm sure we'll get back to that in the end when we do our kind of stars and wishes for the world. Um, but I also think that it's really important for us to talk a little more personally about our journeys and the things, the stars and wishes we have and the issues that we have with the world. And so with that, what's, what's your mental health journey been like um, while transitioning or during any time? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll go first. So I, I like to say what I have. I have anxiety, PTSD and depression. Um, and I've had those, I would say, my entire life. Um, but being raised in a Caribbean household, we don't believe in mental health at times. So take that how you will. Um, coming to America, I was able to get the resources necessary, really figure out like my triggers and like, you know, get on medication, do things like that. However, I realized a lot of it was tied to not knowing who I was, um, not knowing, not being able to express myself outwardly as a lesbian, not knowing the language for non-binary not knowing the language for transness right like i think a lot of who i am now would have been better served if we had those stories or like experiences spoken about in the classroom um to be honest with you because even down to like queer sex without detail i think those things would have been better served in the classroom to have those conversations so that we know how to express ourselves but right now i could say like i am medicated I am living life. I am happy. I am dealing with my triggers on a daily basis in a healthy manner. I used to be someone that didn't do them in healthy ways. Um, but I'm proud to say I've overcome that and I'm happy to be where I am now. That's beautiful. I'm 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 so happy for you. Like that's, you, that's amazing. Yeah. Like I, I I think we all understand like how much it is to struggle just with our trans identities and, and, and any other you know, things that we uh, intersect with, but um, I'm I I'm in a very similar situation. I I, I was very fortunate coming out. Um, I had a therapist who oh, I had a school social worker um, actually like approach was like, do you know LGBT stuff? I'm like, mm, yeah, I'm part of like the GSA, and they're like, do you know what the T is for? And I'm like, no, not really. <laughs> Because <laughs> like that wasn't a thing in 2005. Like nobody, nobody talked about trans issues in 2005. And um, so like they, they put that little seed in my head and gave me access to, to tools and to language and to resources that allowed me to understand what I was missing and why I was so different and why I wasn't just a tomboy and it wasn't just a phase. And um, it, it, that I, I was very fortunate to have uh, a mental health professional um, who knew what the signs were and who who mm. understood and, and took the time to to go to classes and to research and, and to have that knowledge that they could pass it on to me. Um, I I I wouldn't be alive if it hadn't been for them. Um, and it, it's it's so amazing to now be able to say like yes I. I have depression, I have anxiety, I have ADHD, I'm on the spectrum, and um, but I am I'm medicated, I'm happy, I'm healthy, I am I never thought I would live to see past 21, and here I am at 36 getting to discuss these identities with other people to hopefully empower them, to hopefully give uh, give light when there is darkness to 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 let folks know that like you you can be a nerd, you can play games, and you can be trans. And, and and having that representation is just, it's been so important to me to see. It's been important for my mental health and and I know it's important for others as well. I'm gonna cry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Um, yeah, so for me, like, I I got diagnosed with ADHD last year. Hey, mother um, Yeah, and being, like, 30 and getting an ADHD diagnosis was, like, it was a moment. <laughs> so I kind of grew up with this always, this uh, sense of, you know, something's not right, but I can't put a finger on it and, you know, like, always being all over the place, you know, um, and I'm still not even medicated now because I have certain, um, I have epilepsy. So uh, the way my epilepsy works, um, medication would cause me to have seizures constantly. So, um, but with uh, with ADHD growing up and I, I had all kinds of other things that I was diagnosed with and, you know, nobody could ever really figure out what exactly was going right or wrong. And they they would get it that it kind of made things difficult, much more difficult than it had to be, you know. Um, and my journey has been a, a trek, <laughs> um, you know. Um, like I got diagnosed with depression. Um, I've had I have anxiety, um, and the anxiety is from the ADHD not being diagnosed, you know. Um, and then growing up. You know, like I, um, my parents didn't really shield us from anything like LGBT content or, or otherwise. They had friends that were gay and everything and, and trans and, but I didn't know, I didn't connect the dots, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like it was right in front of me, but the dots just were not connecting because there was also other stuff out there that was telling me this is how it's supposed to be, you know? especially rom-coms. I love rom-coms. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, that's like the most heterosexual genre <laughs> ever. And um, I love it. And having been exposed to that so much as a kid, it was just like, um, wait, <laughs> I'm not going to be that, <laughs> you know? So uh, uh, the the whole journey up to this point has been like, oh okay these are the things that are going on like I'm finally getting the picture like <laughs> I had all the tiny puzzle pieces and I was putting it together and I'm finally starting to see the big picture so it's like <laughs> it's been a journey um I was diagnosed with uh anxiety and depression in high school um before I was out as trans and before I knew I was trans um, and so I've been doing like therapy and my mental health journey for longer than I've been having my trans journey. Um, it just got more complicated when I realized and came out and decided I wanted to be recognized as trans and to medically transition in the ways that I wanted to, um, because having anxiety and depression and marking those on any of my doctor intake forms meant that they could use those diagnoses to invalidate my transness. Mm -hmm. So they could be like, are you sure you're trans or are you just depressed? Um, <laughs> or are you sure you're trans or is your anxiety just manifesting as uh, like dysphoria and body dysmorphia? Um, and so the like several years long process of therapist and doctor shopping until I found people who didn't immediately see my list of mental health uh, concerns and totally disavow anything else that I brought to the table because they were like, well, maybe it's just a manifestation of your mental illness. Um, and like how frustrating that was and how that put me so far behind where I wanted to be as a person. Um, and like also um, like uh, I'm very fortunate uh, in that I have, uh, had the like gender uh, surgery, like the gender confirming surgeries that I want to have. Um, but like getting them took five years because every doctor I went to was like, well, you have depression and we don't really think that people with depression should get major surgery because it can uh, cause problems. And I was like, okay, but please consider I will be a little bit less depressed if I can be who I want to be every day of my life. It ah. won't cure <laughs> it won't cure my depression, but it can't make it worse. <laughs> um, <Ain't that. laughs> 
uh, and just uh, that sort of thing. And then also like um, as a queer polyamorous person, finding a therapist who isn't going to be weird about that is so hard. Um, who, when I say my husband and my spouse, isn't going to be like, what do you mean you have two partners? Like, uh, and the like pushback that I've gotten from a lot of that of like, well, why do you need this? Like what, what is missing in your life that you need multiple romantic partners? And I'm like, nothing is missing in my life. I just love people and that's okay. <laughs> um, and so I think for me, a lot of the frustration is just with the way that the system is so stacked against us to the point where when we, when we go out of our way to get diagnosed and try to get help for our mental health issues, people can then use that as a way to not give us the care we need as trans people or the care we need as fat people, as femme people, as people of color, because those same factors come in to every conversation about health of like, well, maybe you don't actually need this because of X, Y, Z factor that has nothing to do with the topic at hand. Um, and kind of to uh, echo what Noam was saying earlier, um, I got married recently uh, and uh, I mentioned at my wedding uh, that I never thought I would get here. Cause like, as a person, I didn't think I'd make it to 25 um, by any means. Uh, and I certainly like the, and like the reinforcement of like all the characters you see in media who are queer are like young, fit, conventionally attractive people, and they still don't make it. And so seeing that being a disabled person, uh, mm -hmm. like being like, oh, well, if the like, conventional ideal of what a queer person should be can't make it in this world why should I expect that I can um and so like getting to this point and getting to have my wedding and say it on my wedding day like I'm so happy to be here um was really like striking for me and like I want to be that for other people because like older queer folks in my life have absolutely been a saving factor for me like knowing older trans folks knowing older queer folks has been what kept me alive and kept me going. And so I'm looking forward to a point in time where I can be that older trans person for those folks. Um, and also be a person who can help navigate the healthcare system that does not wish to navigate us in a meaningful way. Sorry, I talked a lot. <laughs> no, you're good. Yeah. You, I That was all really important and I'd like to have an intimate moment here now. <laughs> With with my fellow um, healthcare, mental health care providers. Hi, I, I love you all. And we need to fucking do better because we are killing people. These stories are not just stories. They are the experiences of people who did not make it to, who are not here to sit on a panel. And they're the reason why we have things like Trans Day of Remembrance, because the idea that someone having to live a lie 24 seven for years is, go, is more at risk from having a surgery or getting hormones that could align them with how they feel and know themselves to be and exist in the universe, that that is more dangerous than forcing them to continue to live in a world that feels false, in a mm. body that does not work, mm. in a place where they feel hated and disregarded and ignored, that is medicalized transphobia and it is lethal. Mm. What we are seeing in multiple states, multiple countries, multiple municipalities across the world, this weaponized, legalized, mandated transphobia is lethal to people like us like your friends, like the people who hear the shit you say because they haven't come out and you think you're in like-minded company. Q 
keeping knowledge away from people when what they really need is to understand why what society has told them does not feel congruent, keeping that knowledge away, that's the malpractice. Stop doing shit just because it's signed into laws, please. Mm. We have to do better as providers. We need to push for not needing a goddamn diagnosis because being other than what one specific set of cultural norms has colonized the world with is not a mental illness. <laughs> we could go on here, but I wanted to have an interlude here, us together as providers so that we can stop fucking killing people and being complicit in a system that would rather have trans death than trans life and joy. Mm. And yes, per chat, teachers, you too, fam. <laughs> yeah. It's wild. So like, so I mentioned earlier, I'm an activist. So in New York City, I think like a month ago, we have been starting to advocate for like a safe haven to make New York State a safe haven. And essentially, if we're providing gender affirming care, medical professionals can't get arrested for providing that care. And I think that's ridiculous that like we have to even make that a thing so that people can feel protected to do their jobs, to make sure that people are uh, getting the surgeries that make them feel who they are. It's ridiculous. Because it's amazing. So, and, and I tell this story as part of my, um, my gender journey. So um, when I was in high school and middle school, I was offered testosterone. Not because I wanted it, but because as a literal child, I was ace and I was not interested in sex and did not have a libido and wasn't interested in masturbating. And so they offered me testosterone in case I wanted to be a more sexually active child. What? 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 How old were you? <laughs> what age was um, I was in. I was in high school. Um, this this was my gynecologist at the time. My uh, parental unit was in the room and was more than happy to do it if I wanted to do it in order for me to have a libido as a fucking child. Uh. Um, and I think it's wild that as a cis girl, and I specifically use girl um, here, as a perceived cis girl child, mm -hmm. they would have just handed me over testosterone. I knew more about testosterone and the different ways that it could be administered before I knew anything about transness because they wanted to fix the fact that maybe I didn't want babies. So like you could, there. I'm sorry, I'm gonna just say it. So they were gonna give you this, not knowing if you were gonna go out there and have unprotected sex, if you were gonna have a child and have a healthy child and what, what, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, they, I'm feeling a they lot were, of emotion. They were, they were going to give me testosterone to fix my libido because, you know, that's what we want all it's young children to have in puberty. Like we it's not it's not important that it had all kinds of side effects. Um, especially because technically I was at an age like I was at an age where that wasn't like it was an ongoing conversation, but like it was even a little cuspy um, on on there. There was nothing about my and I still am not on testosterone or anything, but the fact that like they were like, yeah, um, there's patches, there's creams like I knew all of this stuff. They even talked about dosages and I'm like, and now here I am as a provider where I have to fight 
for the people I see to be able to get access to these things that were going to right. readily be handed to me at fucking 13 years old because, oh, well, you should have a libido at 13. Like, we'll give you tea. Like, similar... I, oh, sorry. Oh, no, please, please, go ahead. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just, I'm floored. Similar yeah. vein, because um, I'm also <clears throat> on the ACE spectrum. Um, like, after I got um, top surgery, uh, one of my doctors was like, oh, well, are you more interested in sex now because you're more like bodily what you want to be? Because I guess having tits or no tits is supposed to change whether or not, you know, I'm Demi. Because, <laughs> yeah, they were just like, well, now that you like your body is more what you want, maybe you'll want to have sex with people and, you know, have children in our heteronormative society. <laughs> I was denied testosterone at 19. I'm an adult. I'm an adult. I am a mm -hmm. legally recognized adult. I brought my mom with me because I was terrified, okay? Finally got the note to go to an endocrinologist. I get this crockety old white guy who just flat out said no. I'm not going to give you this. No one's going to give you this. It took me seven years afterwards to finally get on testosterone because I finally jumped through every hoop from the Howard Brown standards of care to finally get access to that. When I could have just told them I was ace and didn't want to have <laughs> sex. <laughs> so listen, bad. listen. Here's the other thing. To you in sixth grade. Here's what? the other thing. What's wild too? You know what else I was offered in oh high God. school? A breast reduction. Are you shitting me? No. <laughs> I'm very serious. But we no. medical professionals have gender care. Medical professionals were like, "Wow, this pre this this pubescent chick's tits are huge." Maybe we should consider cutting him off and giving her tea. I'm like, what? that's the trick. You just have to be cis and at like what? I have to basically be basically transitioning. That's hilarious to me. <laughs> in rural, in a rural, um, rural small town community where queerness absolutely not but how do we make sure that the tits are contained and that the sex is copious? <laughs> Let's transition this person and not call them queer. Like, <laughs> I had to, I had to be on testosterone for a whole year before they would even let me talk to the therapist that could sign the letter for me to get top surgery, which like for me was fine because I wanted to be on testosterone, but not all non-binary people do. And like, so if you don't want that, if you don't want the like side effects that come with that, and you have the insurance that I happen to have, like you can't get top surgery without being on hormones for a whole year. So, this is actually reminding me of like uh, something, it's a little bit of a trend, not even really a trend, but it's something I've seen on TikTok. There's actually like mask lesbians who are going in and saying they just want um, a, a reduction. And they are getting top surgery, um, and they're that's how they're they're getting around the rules so that they can um, have a, a masculinized uh, chest. Um, like they're not, yeah, they're not doing any kind of they're not doing hormones. They're just straight up like I just want to have a male contoured chest and like, but they're saying breast reduction very specifically. That's what they're going in for and saying they're trying to do, and then that's how they're getting around their insurance. And, um, you know, like, like seeing, like, people shouldn't have to, like, go around like that. Like, right. it should just straight up be like, you know, this is what I want and get it covered. But, um, but yeah, that's, that's something I've actually been seeing. And uh, it, it's wild that people have to 
get around it or even like go through all these hoops to for it to be legitimate um and then the money the money is a big thing so it's just oh, it's frustrating yeah. I, I had a crowdfund i crowdfunded for for my top surgery um i was very fortunate to be um in in like i i had a social media presence and um just was very, very fortunate to have the support that I did. But when when you have to do stuff like that, it, it feels so dehumanizing because I shouldn't mm. have to tell thousands of people and beg them for a dollar so that I could go get this care when my, clearly I've got doctors now, right? I've been on testosterone. I was living as a man for 10 plus years, like, I, I, I went through every hoop, every hoop, and it still took me 10 plus years to transition. Man, what, I, it makes me wonder, like, what life would have been like, how earlier would I have been happier at 19, at 18, if they had just allowed me to have all that right then and there? And you survived. Not a lot of people are, let's, let's be honest, a lot of yeah. people are not going to survive that because they can't wait. Because they can't wait, because they can't wait. Nope. I, I just, I, I was very fortunate that I, I, I had a family who completely loved me and accepted me no matter what. I have friends who loved me and accepted me no matter what. I, I made sure to surround myself with other queer people. I found trans groups. Um, being in, you know, near Chicago, I would go on the weekends to, to the Howard Brown Center, which is like a huge LGBT healthcare hub. Um, so I had access. I had that privilege. And there are people, most people who are trans don't have that. Mm. And most of them don't make it, which is just, the numbers are horrifying. And I know this touches on something that I know some folks wanted to talk about is, because right now we're talking about essentially having to stealth to get health care. Um, and so I don't know if we want to define what we mean by stealth and then talk about um, talk about that, um, not just in healthcare settings, but even just socially. Um, and particularly, uh, we touched on it briefly earlier about like in gaming, but it just seems like we're kind of there right now, if you want to go there. Um, yeah, so, you know, in gaming, um, obviously, if you're female presenting, or you have a lighter more feminized voice in gaming group chats, uh, and voice chats and such. Like I didn't play video games for a long time because I don't I don't have great uh vocal control. So sometimes um, you know, my voice will vary from really low to really high um at any minute. <laughs> and uh so obviously like at some point my voice will give me away, even if I sound more neutral or lower when I start. And um so like this this uh playing games a lot of times especially if I'm in a room like a voice chat and it's random like it's it's tricky because mm. uh, you know the minute they hear that that feminized voice they some gamers out there get real weird they get so weird I'm just like just play the game you know play the <laughs> game have fun let's do it you know like shut up about the other stuff you know i've actually had people ask about cup sizes and i'm just like what like please shut up you know shut up play the game let's go you know um but you know i can also obviously get away with uh being more mask presenting so um and in gaming spaces in person um gaming spaces online um, if I really focus, you know, I can just pass and, but I shouldn't have to do that. I should never, ever have to do that. Um, having a, all right, well, how do I say this? So I feel like in the cis world, people see me as a woman, obviously, uh, because I have a bigger chest area. I have no butt, but I have a bigger chest area. Um, <laughs> I'm 44 double Gs. And I think having that, um, having them misgender me in that way has gotten me jobs and into spaces that 
I probably wouldn't have been in if I had correctly, I like changed how they see me. If I had identified as, oh, I'm trans mask or like I'm non-binary, I don't, I know for a fact these white men, this cishet white men would not have allowed me into these spaces. I'm thankful now that I'm tied to like activist organizations where being who I am is now a privilege because I'm in the activist spaces, right? Um, which then gets me into the political rooms. But when I was doing the inverse before, it was never a thing. So being stealth in those scenarios has gotten me paid, but it should have never fucking been like that. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's disgusting that we even have to do that. I have to manipulate people just to get a check. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm at a stage in uh, my transness uh, where TERFs can't tell what kind of trans person I am. Um, and so like uh, my, uh, my key lanyard for work and for home, it has my car keys on it, has the trans flag on it. I have the trans flag in all of my like bios on sites and things. Um, and also like I'm a very avid cosplayer um, and so, like, my gender expression, especially on the internet, is extremely varied um, at all times. Uh, and so I get a lot of people who assume because I'm loud about being trans that I'm trans femme because the cis world has such a narrow view of transness that they assume that everyone who is trans is a trans woman. And that's, like, absolutely the work of TERFs. Like, TERFs have created this space where trans women are the only trans people in the spotlight and all trans mask folks are actually just uh, content warning for turf misgendering, confused girls, mm. quotation marks, um, or are just men and get split over entirely the experience that we have as trans masks and like we just get lumped into men nebulous. Um, and so like uh, part of stealthing for me is kind of navigating that in between of like, okay, this person doesn't like trans people. Are they going to misgender me or are they going to accidentally gender me correctly because they think I'm trans femme and thus are going to call me he, him pronouns to be mean to me. Um, and it's kind of like the, like this dichotomy of like, well, I can never be what anyone thinks I am. Um, and like, sort of trying to like also like uh there's not really a way to stealth as a non-binary person in the like traditional sense of stealthing where uh oh I don't know if we or we told said what stealthing was for the audience stealthing is no, living we're gonna cover that yeah yeah <laughs> uh stealthing is living as your true gender without folks knowing that you're trans so like if you are a trans man or a trans woman living your life as a man or a woman without people knowing necessarily that you are trans or what your gender at birth is. Um, but because non-binary isn't I, like a gender identity that's like accepted worldwide or like prevalent in like society and culture, like people are always like, well, okay, what are you then? Because you're not a man and you're not a woman. So what am I supposed to call you? What are you supposed to be? Um, and so that makes like every conversation I enter into and like I'm uh, I work in like community organizing and government. So um, like I'm also just kind of used to being like, hey, we're having this roundtable and I'm going to start by telling you all my pronouns and then everyone else is going to know that they can also tell me their pronouns. Um, but like. I am just kind of used to having to out myself in every situation that I'm in because it's either out myself or get misgendered consistently. Um, and so that makes things difficult to navigate. And like a lot of times I'm like, I wish I didn't have to be so visibly trans all the time and like have that be at the forefront of how everyone interacts with me. But it's a part of who I am and it's that or living a lie. So I'll choose this before that. Mm. So that that's such a like because I, I, I think most folks on the panel identify more towards like trans non-binary um whereas i'm straight up binary y'all there is nothing non-binary about me. i am as mask as can be i got the beard i wear my hair short i got some <laughs> text 
that's paying a lot of money for. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, I don't stealth intentionally. This is how I, I, I talk, how I present myself. The ideals that I believe in are incredibly masculine. Um, and it gets me in the door. Mm. In doors that nobody wants to be in. Because now I'm in the boys club. Mm. And that, I, I was a paramedic. I played sports. I do all of these things as a, a, a white man. So they don't know that I'm ace. They don't know that I'm pan. They don't, they don't know that I'm trans. And I've, there are some situations that I've been in where, especially when it comes to like video games and stuff, like you don't talk about those identities because it's not safe to. Because as soon as they find out, I could get the shit kicked out of me. I could be straight up murdered in those situations mm-hmm. like it's not funny it's not it's it, it's it's terrifying mm-hmm. to know that stealth there is an inherent danger when you have to stealth and yeah. the things that i hear the things that i've seen from people like i don't feel safe in men's spaces but i'm also not accepted into women's spaces yeah so, and, and, and i respect that and i understand that but I present so masculine that it, it, it's there's just no place for me, and so that can be really infuriating sometimes. It can be frustrating to be, you know, it's very exclusionary. Um, but I've come to accept that because I would rather just be me, and and there, and when I'm allowed into these places, into these spaces that are predominantly cis het white men, right? Um, I'm able to speak up and say something. I, I I don't mind putting myself at risk now because I'm so comfortable with who mm-hmm. I am. I am so surrounded by people who love me for who I am that I don't care what anybody wants to say. If you're going to say something, you better say it to my face. <laughs> okay. And so I will out these people. I, I will I will rip them down if I have to. I, I will have those hard hitting conversations. Um, because you have to and it starts from people who can get inside those places and I'm one of those people and and it's it's not the responsibility of anybody it's not my responsibility to have to do that there are just some times where it's safe enough to do that and if you can do something when people say something transphobic when people say something ableist when people say something racist say something say something I feel like that part needs to be clipped on how you effectively be like a privileged white man. Like when people are <laughs> privileged white men, they're just like, how do I support blah, blah, that. So I just say something. That. <laughs> Start by <laughs> doing literally anything. <laughs> right, literally anything. Literally anything. Yo, I got to grow up to be, to be a, a, a cis white man (laughs) (laughs) that whole society is wild they are so confused about themselves they need help (laughs) (laughs) yeah well well and this is the thing right and this is the thing too because this is so like this is stratified across different identities too right because i very clearly pass as a like until i open my mouth um as a cis black woman and unfortunately those spaces are frequently deeply transphobic um because they are also frequently deeply christianized in a way that has obscured our actual heritage and our actual birthrights and the the like (laughs) pre-colonial um like we didn't used to do this shitness um Mm. of of black diaspora and and so like it's also that that situation too of of like okay so (laughs) I'm going to be like, let's talk about being the the loud, angry black queer, like, let's go. Because again, it's not funny and it's not cute. And it's like, 
the fact that because my body is shaped a certain way, like I am automatically categorized is deeply problematic. And the things people are willing to say when they think that they are in like minded, bigoted company is really terrifying. And it's got to stop because trans black women have some of the highest unsolved murder rates of anyone mm -hmm. period mm -hmm. period and the amount of times i have gone on a date <laughs> to find myself feeling deeply unsafe because we were talking and i was like yeah no, nah, I'm like, not real. I don't, they're like, wait, do you have a dick? I'm like, oh. I have a knife and I'm going right. to leave. Yeah. Try it. Like, don't follow me. I'm going to see myself out and we're done. Because the, um, what used to be called the panic defense, the trans panic defense, Mm -hmm. is is real and lethal for those who don't know bless your heart and i'm sorry to have to tell you this uh trans panic is a defense that was utilized legally and uh was only recently outlawed in many places um i don't think it's federally outlawed where uh a predominantly cis man could get away with murdering a trans woman based on the pure simple fact that she was trans oh i panicked is a thing and that's terrifying like how like what that does to our ability to feel safe mm -hmm. to trust people like my penis is bought it is purple and glorious, so not the kind that they mean, but just the fact that you can see that shift in people is horrifying, and it makes you feel like you can't be yourself because you're at constant risk of being brutally and unceremoniously murdered and dumped in a dumpster, which is something that we have a problem with in Chicago of unsolved trans black trans women ending up in dumpsters and that's really fucked up is it any wonder that we're like this, we struggle to find because these people are your teachers mm. these mm -hmm. people are your uber drivers and your doctors and your lawyers and your lawmakers Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I, I am a believer in letting things breathe. Yeah. And it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. We are towards the end of today's panel. And so <clears throat> I I again don't want to leave out of here with our trauma. I don't that's not how we started. It is an important conversation, but that's not how we're leaving it here. So stars and wishes for the world. What do you like, what do you want to see done better? What do you want to see more of that can be representation in games that can be representation in medical field that can be just stories of joy being told ways of telling them spaces to access whatever it is this is going to be kind of our 
outro. So who you are, where people can find you, and what do you want to leave the folks with today? It can also be resources. Uh, so I'll go. Uh, my name is Ace, pronouns they, them. You can find me at any, like on any website, a underscore typical queer. I'm mostly active on Twitter, unfortunately, um, given recent events. <laughs> that goes away. I am screwed. Um, and as somebody that, like, I don't know, like, government and politics has been my entire career thus far, I want to see changes politically. I want to see changes in laws, policies. I want to see inclusive policies. I want to see more trans people in the legislature. I want to see more representation in the state government, the federal government, local governments, or our people, um, because the fuck are people that don't understand us going to make laws for us, like, make it make sense, and math ain't math, and, um, and I want to be one of those people, so definitely want to run for office sometime soon, um, and I will continue to do my activism to make sure that at least New York State trans people are effectively represented in the ways that they can be. Also, shout out Award winning ace, right? <laughs> no, no, congratulations. Thank you. We, we oh, are not yeah. about to do a trans panel without acknowledging his <laughs> excellence. Yeah. Come on Thank now. You. Thank you. I am also the recipient of the 2022 Community Impact Award for Equality New York, a queer, uh, important, and very huge queer led advocacy organization. Um, and it was amazing. I went up there and I said, yo, I didn't plan a speech. I don't know what to say when the room isn't made for you. What the fuck do you say when you accept that acknowledgement? Um, but it was amazing. Thank you for acknowledging that. Always. Next up is Sahara. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, you know, I'm Sahara. I, you can find me on uh, pretty much anywhere you start Saga Swag. Uh, if you guys need me to spell that out, I'll, I'll spell that out here in the chat or something <laughs> um but yeah I've, I've also been primarily a tweeter so the twitter saga happening right now is so chaotic um we'll see where i go next <laughs> um as for my like wishes uh you know i just want to see more just so much more non-binary and trans representation even like npcs that are just chilling and you know being themselves it's uh you know main characters uh you know like side characters like just just throw us in there as people you know don't don't throw us in there as like a a token you know mm. but as much in the background as you want <laughs> you know you're allowed to do that um and then um i just i just want to see more stories you know uh, more stories that tell a little bit of a different um narrative than what we typically see you know um joyful stories and you know even even different um cultural stories you know um but yeah that's that's my wish for the world Rue. I'm Rue. I use they, he, or Z pronouns if you're feeling spicy. Uh, you can find me on Twitter as at Ilana Knight 13 if the website doesn't burn down before this stream is over. Um, and everywhere else as just Ilana Knight uh, without the 13 at the end. Um, and uh, I am present uh, earlier this year, I organized the Tabletop RPGs for Trans Rights in Texas bundle, which raised over $400,000 for two trans nice. charities in Texas. And I'm presently in the middle of organizing the Tabletop RPGs for Trans Rights in Florida bundle. Um, so I'm collecting games uh, and that bundle should be live to go on sale for charity sometime either late next week or early uh, the following week. So if you follow me on Twitter or follow Itch on Twitter, because I'm partnering with Itch on that, you can get involved in that process. Um, and so that's what I'm doing. That's what I do. Uh, and my wishes for the world are I'd love to see and I'd love to be able to facilitate more queer intergenerational connections 
because we lost so many elder queers because of AIDS and because of homophobic and transphobic policy that a lot of younger queers don't have the like people to look up to in spaces that cishet people have. Um, and so I would love to see more spaces where we can make those intergenerational connections and like keep a hold of those stories that elder queers have and that experience and use that to help our community grow stronger. And Noam? Yeah, uh, thank you so much for having me. My name is Noam, pronounce him. You can find me everywhere, literally everywhere uh, at Nomadic. Um, and uh, I've, I'm the community manager for Checkbox Teams. I don't know, I don't do anything nearly as cool in activism as everybody else here does. Uh, but uh, I, the the one thing that I want to I want to impart on people is I'm a big fan of the if you see something say something and we are all gonna be sitting at some table in the next two months in the next monthish and a half you've got Thanksgiving you've got Hanukkah you've got every every holiday that's coming up and I want you because it's gonna happen it is I promise you gonna happen someone's gonna bring up Trump. Someone's going to bring up something racist. Someone's going to bring up something sexist. Someone's going to bring up something transphobic. And I want you to say something. I want you to tell Aunt Karen to sit the fuck down and shut up. That's what I want you to do. You want to start making change? You have to start with your own family. You have to start with yourself and start with your own family. So do that. Do that. Yeah. And um, I am Cassie. I have been your moderator. Um, I posted in chat a GoFundMe for uh, a friend and former panelist uh, brand and trans person, uh, Brandy Rose, who is trying to get to safety um, and get safely back home to Germany. So if you can share that, donate, um, do what you can. It's crunch time. We've only got two weeks to help them get safe. And I want... Um, I want more safety in the world. I want to see more gaming spaces that are safe for people to be brave and be in and explore things and themes in. I want more therapy rooms that are safe for people to actually go to and get the support and help that they need at the time because just because you don't hate us doesn't mean that you can be our therapist mm. it doesn't mean that you have the knowledge and skills and you do a lot of harm by practicing outside of your scope so get the education if you actually want to help as a professional and families community spaces intergeneral in intergenerational spaces religious spaces that are safe for people to have the spiritual connections and awakenings that they want to without having to hide themselves and their gender. I just want a world where we can be safe to wrestle with hard things that aren't whether or not people think we should exist. So thank you everyone for coming to our panel. Um, our next panel is going to be in on uh, January 15th. It is the East Asian panel. Um, so stay tuned for information on who those panelists are going to be and what we're going to be doing next. But thank you for spending this time with us. To, as a reminder, tomorrow is Trans Day of Remembrance. Please support trans people, not just during Trans Week, but every day in any way that you possibly can. And we are not all the same. And our cultures and things are also not all the same. Thanks everyone, take care and have a wonderful rest of your Saturday. Bye.